It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or how much money you have. You can create momentum. You were born to run, find that scene, run through it, and create momentum for yourself and your business. Welcome to the Simple Brand Podcast, the show dedicated to helping you create simple experiences for your customers and for your team members. Each week, we're bringing you amazing interviews with business leaders and authors who will teach you how to differentiate your business with the one thing your customers need the most, simplicity. Your customers live in a complex world. Let's make it simple. Now, here's your host, Matt Lyles. Do you ever feel like the odds are just stacked against you? Well, I hate to be the one to break it to you, but they actually are. The world continues to evolve at a rapid pace. Customer expectations have never been higher. And customers are bombarded with distracting messages and experiences from an ever-growing number of businesses all competing with you. So how can you consistently cut through all that clutter and stand out? Following the old rules of engagement isn't enough. Even being considered great isn't enough Following the old rules of engagement isn't enough. Even being considered great isn't enough as overwhelming competition keeps redefining what great really is. It actually comes down to developing, building, and riding momentum. And that's why I'm happy to talk with Mark Schaefer this week. Mark's an international keynote speaker, consultant, and author. He's a faculty member at the Graduate Studies Program at Rutgers University. His blog, Grow, is hailed as one of the top marketing blogs in the world. He's the host of one of the top 10 marketing podcasts, The Marketing Companion. And he's the author of nine books, including Marketing Rebellion and his latest, Cumulative Advantage. Mark and I discuss his cumulative advantage lessons on building unstoppable momentum through five key factors. And what's great is that these factors apply no matter the size of your business. And they can even be applied to help you create unstoppable momentum in your own professional career. So here it is. Here's my interview with Mark Schaefer. Hi, Mark. Welcome to the show. Hey, Matt. I'm delighted to be here with you. Yeah, well, thanks for being here. I have I have enjoyed your lessons from Cumulative Advantage. Well, good. You know, the book has had such an impact on people. And when you write a book, you just never know how it's going to sort of reveal itself with its with your readers. And I, I I was confident in it. I thought it was a good book, but it's really had an emotional impact on people that honestly is sort of unexpected. Oh, wow. I can see that. As I had seen the book, I'd seen it coming out. I thought, well, yeah, that makes sense. Like that's a good lesson right there. But then walking through the pattern, it's yeah. digging a little bit deeper and saying, oh, like this really, really hits home. I remember the first person that I know of who read the book, at least who was public about it, posted something on social media and he said, I just read Mark Schaefer's book. This is the first book I opened and read all the way through in one sitting without stopping. And then I stayed up all night thinking about it. I thought, oh, that's interesting. But it has really sort of pushed people in new directions. I think it is. And I think it's needed here, especially in 2021. But my understanding, so I'm assuming that you started writing this, you were creating this pre-pandemic, is that right? Yeah, I started writing this in the summer of 2019, had it about one third completed when literally all hell broke loose on every front in, in our country. Right. When it came to, it was like March or April and By this time, I had COVID. (laughs) My wife had COVID. Oh, wow. My business had crashed. The streets are burning. Yeah. It was just this amazing, catastrophic time. And I have a very, very good friend 
he's more than a mentor. He's, he's sort of a muse and, and one of the most brilliant men I know. His name is Keith Jennings, who has contributed to my blog for a while. And now he's one of my co-hosts of my podcast. And I sent him the chapters that I had written. And I said, Keith, is this still a book? <laughs> oh. In the context of, of how everything has changed. And he sent me a, a very short note back and it was capital Y E S exclamation point. He said, not only is this a needed book, it's your best book. This is your legacy. So that gave me the courage and the validation to keep on going. Yeah, there you go. And I think everybody, no matter who you are, no matter how successful you are, everybody tends to question themselves, like, am I doing the right thing? Should I keep going with this? And it really helps to get that validation. But to understand that you had already, you had concepted the book, you'd already begun writing it before the world yeah. shut down and all hell broke loose. And then to read the book and see, it makes more sense, even more so today, even post-pandemic. Yeah. I didn't really vary the structure or the main ideas, but definitely there was an emotional tone in the book that was set by the pandemic. And then if you got to the end of the book, the last chapter of the book, and I'm not kidding, the last chapter of the book was the hardest writing I've ever done. It was really, it took me three months to write that one chapter. And the reason was, is I ex sort of explain in the book that it was very haunting writing this book because the book is about, maybe we should say what it's about, cumulative advantage is about building momentum. So I had two audiences in my mind. One was the people who love me and read my blog and come to my talks and buy my books. And the other audience was a family that I work with in an economically disadvantaged area of our city. I've worked with them for more than a decade. We've kind of like come alongside them and try to, you know, keep them on a track where they have a path to have some opportunity. I realized that any business book, any book that's sort of a self-help book is by definition elitist because it assumes you have the money to buy the book. It assumes you have the time to read the book and respond to the book and you have resources to throw at the changes you wanna make in your life. And I was haunted by the fact that many people don't have that opportunity and it just didn't seem very fair. And so the last chapter of the book I spend talking about, all right, this is how we know momentum begins and how momentum happens. In the book, I set out this pattern that has been researched and validated by decades of academic study. We know how it works. Now, what I struggled with and why it took three months to write the last chapter, what do we do with this? What do we do right. with this? As an individual, if, if we know how momentum works, is there anything in our power that we can do to help create some positive momentum in the world. And I did my best to explain what we can do. There you go. Yeah. It's interesting hearing that it took you three months to be able to write that one chapter. It was really just gut wrenching because I had to end the book just right. It had to be honest and it had to be raw. And I had to go to places where I normally do not go in my writing and my public appearance. And I wanted to end with just a beacon of hope. So there were a few people who were beta readers for me who saw the different variations of the end. So they were right there with me, but it was really, really hard to write. Oh, I can imagine. Well, then you talked about that feeling of being elitist when it yeah. comes to any book like this. And to me, that ties somewhat to one of the things that you talk about is that's one of the drivers, one of the key drivers around this is the Matthew effect. So yeah. can you talk to me about the Matthew effect? Well, it's really quite uh, a very interesting story. There was a famous sociologist named 
Robert Merton. I feel sure your listeners have never heard of him because who can name any famous sociologist? But he was famous in sociology circles. And he was a great man. He really was. He was a great, great academic. Many of the sociological and psychological terms that we use today came from his research. And he grew up as a poor immigrant. He was in South Philadelphia in the slums of South Philadelphia, and he was so poor that at times he couldn't even go to school. He had to help his family make ends meet. Uh, They were very, very poor. His father had a dairy delivery business and it burned to the ground. And so that just made things worse. But despite everything, every evening, Robert would walk to the Carnegie Library and read. And he did this so often that the librarians basically adopted him as as their little boy and helped him. And, you know, he was walking from the slums into this, you know, rather wealthy part of town. And it occurred to him, we just keep getting poorer and the rich keep getting richer. How does that happen? How do you get into that sort of momentum? Well, against all odds, he got a scholarship to Temple University. And against all odds, he got a scholarship to Harvard University, and he earned his PhD and began teaching sociology at Columbia University. And while he was there, his students were grumbling, and they said, Professor Merton, it's just not fair. We do all the work, and these elite professors get all the credit. We do all the research for them, and we just get poorer and poorer, and they get bigger offices, more staff, more money. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer, and it's not fair. And Merton said, I know. And it reminds me of a verse of the Bible. It's in Matthew 25, 29, 25, 29. And that's where we get this phrase, the Matthew effect. Now, if you're a theologian, it's actually kind of taken out of context. And I added that in a footnote in the book, if you're right, if you're particular that way, but The idea is the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And so he and his research assistant studied Nobel Prize winners. And long story short, what they found was that the Nobel Prize winners of their day, they were all white men, weren't the best academics. They weren't the greatest writers or researchers, but there was something that started this momentum for them. And once they got the Nobel Prize, the momentum was unstoppable. And so this inspired him to create this paper called The Matthew Effect. It's one of the most famous papers in sociological research. As far as I know, the only other real reference to this in popular culture was a reference in one of Malcolm Gladwell's books, very small reference. So this has been now researched and validated across so many careers and industries across entertainment, technology, education, that if you have this small advantage and leverage it in a certain way, you can create this momentum. And now here was the fun part. So this is what tantalized me. So in Merton's writing, in the original paper, he said that Once you have this initial advantage, you can create this momentum and you will separate yourself from your competitors to a larger and larger degree forever, unless there are countervailing processes. But he didn't say what the countervailing processes were. Right. I read and I read and I read and I listened to his talks. I couldn't find it. So finally, I wrote his son. His son is alive. His son teaches at MIT. And I do not think this is a coincidence. His son won a Nobel Prize in economics. I think there's some cumulative advantage going on there. I think so. So his son said, look, I'm not the right person to talk to. You need to talk to my stepmother. She was his researcher who did this project. That's right. Yeah. I contacted her and she said, oh, I'm so happy to hear from you. Here are all our unpublished papers that discuss this. And so I was able to weave a lot of this wisdom into the book and create a fuller picture of what this means. If you don't have natural advantages in your life, how do you create 
advantage? How do you create cumulative advantage on your own? And that's kind of the beauty and the simplicity of the book. Yeah, because, you know, like the book title says, you're going against the odds. I mean, basically, most people, yeah, the odds are stacked against you, especially today. Yeah. Yeah, just more and more. And then, you know, just given where we are with technology, with all kinds of variables, you know, looking forward into like how inflation may affect things, Mm. we're bombarded with more and more odds being stacked against us. So how can we beat the odds? There are a couple of key ideas in the book. I think the most important one that is really impacting a lot of people is this idea of the seed. It's sort of a new way to think about strategy. When I was a young guy in business, strategy was a 250-page paper and a five-year plan. And that just doesn't work these days. And a seam works more like an American football team, where it's strength against strength, literally facing each other. And the coaches are sitting above the field And they're trying to look at the other team and find a weakness. Right. Is someone tired? Are they overmatched? Are they out of place? How do we create a scene and burst through that scene with as much power and speed as we can and own that space as long as we can for our gain? And then literally the next play, they start all over again. They keep looking for the next scene. And that's really how great strategy, great innovation and momentum begins today. It starts with an assessment of what are your strengths is it could be an idea. It could be resources. It could be a certain education, a certain perspective. It could be connections that you have, certain talents that you have. And then how do we apply that to a fracture in the status quo, some shift that's happening in the world today where we can step in just like the football player running through that seam. How do we meet the new unmet and underserved needs of the customers because of this shift in some unique way? How do we apply our skills to be relevant in this moment? Not two years from now, right now. And I think this is really resonating with a lot of people because arguably, Matt, the pandemic is the greatest fracture in the status quo, maybe in human history when all this is over with, right? Everything is changing. Everything is being renegotiated. How we work, where we work, when we work, how we learn, how we teach, how we connect and commune how we date, how we work out our relationship with food and the environment. It's everything is changing. It is not going to be the same. Everything is shifting. And these are all opportunities. So let me give you one little example of how this works from my own life. When the pandemic hit last year, I got sick. I got my wife picked up COVID on a family ski trip. She brought it home. I got it from her. I guess we were sort of sick or quarantined for about eight weeks. And in that period, we couldn't go to the store. Now, I was reading the news. I saw this thing coming. So I started stocking up on some things, but we weren't prepared for this. So we subscribed to HelloFresh, right? So number one. Nice. And we still subscribe to it because we kind of like it. But think about this. This was a fracture in the status quo, right? People needed to have this delivery service. They didn't want to go to the store. We're still using it. Now, isn't that profound that part of our grocery budget is going to a service I didn't even know existed in January of 2020? Now, when I awoke from my COVID haze, my business was gone. I'm a keynote speaker. All my events were canceled. I teach at Rutgers University. My classes were canceled. I'm a strategy consultant. All my contracts were canceled because people were trying to keep their employees from getting sick and trying to save their businesses. And so my business essentially went to zero. I went through a period of disorientation, trying to figure out where do I fit in in the world? 
And I realized that my core strength is I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher in everything I do. Blog, write, speak, podcast, write books. I'm a teacher. But the world needed me to teach something new. The world needed me to teach them, how do we get through this thing? How do we handle anxiety, uncertainty, disorientation, all the things I was going through? So I started blogging about it. The traffic to my blog doubled. Some people said, this is the best advice I've seen during this whole period. I assembled all this advice into an ebook called Fight to the Other Side, gave it away for free. The last page of the ebook said, if you enjoyed this ebook, just think how much you'll enjoy Mark talking about this at your next leadership meeting, spice up your next Zoom meeting and invite Mark to come and talk one low price. By July and August, I was having record months. I went from zero to record months in a pandemic. Why? Because I applied my skill, my initial advantage to a seam. The seam was people were having all these boring Zoom meetings. They were depressed. They were down. They needed somebody to pump them up and show them the way. And I stepped in and people hired me. Now, just like on a football team, that seam isn't going to last forever. That seam for me, that little business activity is gone now because people have moved on to other things. But I'm looking for new ways to apply my advantages, my skills to seams that are opening now. And you were able to recognize that seam as it was happening. And when we think about football coaches, when they're looking down on the field and they know what to look for, they know how to recognize seams. But what about us? Like, how can we understand what these fractures in the status quo are and how can we find and break through those? Are there any questions we should be asking ourselves? Well, I think for me, the best strategy is I'm always reading and consuming content that is talking about new ideas and trends. I'm seeing things in certain publications like maybe Wired or Fast Company. The Wall Street Journal is a great resource actually because it's talking about big sort of mega global trends and explaining why and what's happening. I read certain newsletters where people are, they're showing current graphs and current ideas and things that are changing. I subscribe to a newsletter about Gen Z just to see what's going on there, what's changing there. And I think the biggest opportunities come when we see something that doesn't make sense. It just kind of makes you go, huh, Here's an example. This was just in the news a couple of weeks ago. I saw this headline said, Hallmark greeting cards exiting the e-card business. Now, you and I know that everybody is moving into e-commerce, not out of e-commerce. Right. What the heck? This is a shift. There's something going on here. I need to figure out why. So I read deep, deep, deep into the article, and here's what it said. There are two main demographics that buy greeting cards. Number one, won't surprise you, senior citizens. Of course. They don't like using computers to send greeting cards. The second demographic that loves greeting cards is Gen Z. Wow. But they want hand-created artisanal cards. That is the huge trend. Yes. Now, if my talent... If my advantage is that I'm an artist that loves to create cards, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start a TikTok channel and show all these people how I'm creating these cards. And I'm going to build an audience and sell a boatload of these things because that's a scene, right? It's another example. You take what is your advantage? What are your special skills and resources? And you apply it to something changing in the world. There's millions of these little fractures occurring all the time, especially now. So we just need to learn. We need to listen. We need to be patient. And we need to see that opportunity, burst through it with as much power and speed as we can. And then recognize, you know, like you were saying earlier, that it's not just a one-time thing. Right. Where's the next scene going to be coming from? 
Right. I'm in a constant state of evolution. That's it. Yeah, that's it. You can't sit still. You can't just be complacent. It has to be constant evolution. Yeah. I mean, I I can't even imagine there are many successful businesses in the world that are sitting on the same strategy they had five years ago. I mean, things are just changing so fast. And you can look at that and say, oh, you know, that's kind of depressing. I'm feeling like I'm falling behind. Or you can look at that and say, oh my gosh, there's new opportunities every day. Right. And if you're missing today's opportunity, good news, there's another one coming tomorrow. Right. Did you know that in addition to my podcast and my articles, I speak to audiences all over to help them simplify their customer experience and simplify their employee experience? I've spent the last few years leading a crusade of simplicity across the globe. If you want a winning brand, you have to provide a simple experience to your customers and to your team members. Whether it's a live event or a virtual event, I'd love to partner with you and teach your audience how to do just that. With over a decade in marketing, I know how to hook and captivate an audience. As a speaker, I know how to connect with the audience. Along with my lessons, I use stories and humor to keep everyone engaged and inspired. Then they leave with the knowledge and next steps to transform their business. As an event planner, you're managing lots of details to give your audience the most memorable event. The last thing you need is a speaker who will make your event memorable for all the wrong reasons. Not only will I leave your audience energized and inspired, I'll make it easy for your team to work with me. Hey, If I've built my brand around simplicity, then you know I'm going to make it simple for you. When you visit mattliles.com slash speaking, you'll find everything you need to know, including details on my topics, promotional materials, and most importantly, a link to connect with my team so we can book your event. So visit mattliles.com slash speaking. I can't wait to help your audience brand out from the crowd. Now, one of the things that you write about is, is about success. And I like how you wrote this. You, you wrote, success is a collision of events. Can you explain that? Well, <laughs> one of the things that I think is very empowering about my book, and I think it should give people a lot of hope, is that there's nothing in this book that anybody can't do. You don't need an Ivy League education, you don't need a million dollars. Anybody, if you just know the pattern of how momentum works, it will create a new vision. You'll never see the world again the same way because every successful person, every successful business you hear about, you'll be able to recognize this pattern that got them there. Now, here's one of the surprising things in the book, at least it was surprising to me, that behind Every successful person and every successful company generally, there was a collision of events, meaning it was kind of random. And when I give my talks and workshops, I'll challenge people. I'll say, think about where you were five years ago or 10 years ago and think about where you are now. Was that part of a grand vision of a strategy or Did you sort of get to where you are and have the opportunities you have now because it was somebody that you met, somebody that encouraged you, maybe a teacher, maybe it was a book you read, a quote in a magazine, maybe a movie, maybe you were in a new city and saw something somewhere that inspired you. And it turns out that almost all great innovations and ideas and momentum start that way. It's just sort of seeing this world where the doors keep opening for us and we have to say, okay, is this a door we go through or a door that we close? And being able to discern that can really help us be better managers of these opportunities of momentum. So it's almost always a collision of events. I can point directly to one event that happened 30 years ago now, maybe. Wow. It was at the very beginning of the internet. I was in a marketing job at a big company and I was stuck. And I just didn't know what my next position was going to be. And my boss wasn't going anywhere. And I looked around. 
I didn't know I was looking for a seam at the time, but I was. And there was this thing going on at the time called the internet. So I studied this a little bit and I went to my boss and I said, I would like an AOL account. (laughs) I would like to put it on my expense account. And after much debate, because he thought this was a total waste of time and money, he agreed. So I started playing around with that. I pursued it. So this is a key idea. I didn't just have this idea. I pursued it, right? I pushed it. I got it going with my boss. Well, it turned out I had some pretty good ideas. I figured out a way we could buy and sell scrap metal more efficiently on the internet. Eventually, this big Fortune 100 company that I worked for said, we need to create a corporate e-business department. Who shall lead it? Oh, Mark Schaefer, you've been doing this longer than anyone. You lead our new global e-commerce department. So there you go. I, soon I was working on digital marketing, CRM, customer portals. I had a global team working for me. I didn't know it at the time, but I was really a pioneer on a lot of B2B uses of, of the internet and social yeah. media. Then I sort of created this competency and I went out on my own and started my own business and started consulting. And that sort of blew up. And that's why I'm here with you today. 100% because I asked for an AOL account with my boss 30 years ago. And it's a random event. It's It's a random conversation. Two weeks after it happened, I probably never even thought about it again. But if you force yourself to go back and think about why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I here? I'm sure it's the same for you. What's your story? What was your random event? That's a good question. I mean, I think it's a series of random events because what I love doing is I love looking backwards to see certain events that happened or certain events that I wanted to happen that actually didn't happen that got me to where I am today. Interesting. So I'm here in Nashville and I moved here in 2019 to start my own venture. Now, mm-hmm. I will say that I had gotten the dream, the desire to move to Nashville around 2010, but I wasn't desperate to leave my job. And so I would find a really cool marketing job every once in a while, like maybe three times a year. So I would interview for it. It would be down to me and somebody else, or sometimes even company would say, Hey, we were actually having to shift gears and we're removing this job opportunity and changing to something else. But all these little things would happen where, you know, I didn't get this job and I was like, gosh, why not? But looking back on that and seeing had I gotten one of those jobs, I wouldn't be where I am today. Right. And I have a friend who said to me after he read my book, he said, oh, this really made me laugh out loud. He said, I can pinpoint the reason I'm in marketing because I had an Achilles tendon tear playing softball. <laughs> what? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. I think he wins. You know, one of the things that I sort of set up in the book, and this was a risk I took in the book, is I inserted myself as sort of a character in the book. And it was not, it was an experiment. It was a risk. It's not something I was totally comfortable with, but, you know, I just thought it made a good story. And I compared my success to Tim Ferriss. That might be a familiar name. He's a (laughs) best-selling author. He's sort of a multimedia mogul. He's pretty successful. He's pretty successful. He's been very, very open about his path of success and what went right and what went wrong. And you could basically trace all of his success to a moment he lost his girlfriend. Oh yeah. Yeah. He got burned out. He was working too much. He lost his girlfriend. He went into a deep depression. He went to Europe and just went, you know, tooling around Europe for a few months. And while he was in Europe trying to recover from all this emotional trauma, He had an idea for a book, which was, by the way, rejected by 26 different publishers before it eventually became a huge New York Times bestselling book. That's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. So what was his advantage? I mean, so you look at all these things that happened with Tim Ferriss, 
Mm-hmm. What turned it for him that put him on his path of momentum? Well, that's why I liked his case study so much. When I was doing research for the book, I got interested in, oh, different business people, different celebrities, entrepreneurs who seemingly started with nothing and then really turned into this amazing success. And the reason I liked Tim as a case study is because you don't have to guess. He tells exactly what he did, when he did it, how much he did it. And it fits the five steps of momentum in this book exactly. So again, what was his initial advantage, right? Number one is that he had to make a fresh start. He had kind of lost everything. And he had this, I don't know, maybe a a period of, of renaissance, of renewal when he was in Europe, where he was able to clear his mind and think about really what he wanted to do. And he started thinking about the reason I lost everything is because I was working too hard. How do I work less? And he had this idea for a book, which became the four hour work week. Now, so that was number one. He had an idea. A lot of people didn't really agree with his idea. They didn't see his idea. He was rejected by 26 publishers. Now, what was the seam? Every generation has a self-help guru. His generation didn't have one. And so it was a really unexpected success. We were at the beginning of the hustle culture. Yeah, that's right. This is something that was new, right? It was like the, the coding culture, the hustle culture, that the number of hours you work was a badge of honor and people were burning out. So when a book comes along, like the four-hour work week, it's going to you know, take off. Now, once you begin that momentum, you've got to then increase awareness to get it to the next level, to keep that momentum going. You need to increase this awareness. In the book, I talk about this concept called the sonic boom. You don't need a lot of PR and a lot of publicity, but you need the right people to start talking about your book. He was very, very smart because he knew Here's who's going to love this book, 30-year-old computer geeks. So he started to go to 30-year-old computer geek events and meetups and network and started giving out his books. And I even interviewed some of the early bloggers from those days. He said, oh my gosh, yeah, the guy was everywhere. He was pushing us, pushing us, pushing us. And when we finally got this book, we just felt like we had to do something for him. And that started this momentum. The next thing is to reach up and reach out to mentors for help. Ferris has been a master at this. He's gotten into venture capital investing. He's gotten into consulting. He's got he's launched an incredible podcast. And at each stage, he talks about the people who he connected with who helped him. He had an amazing strategy when he was so poor and down on his luck and just trying to make things happen. He moved to Silicon Valley and started going to free networking events as a volunteer. And eventually he got to like sort of schedule the programming and spend time with these famous people who were the speakers at these events. That's how he developed his mentoring network. Right. So it was like reaching up, reaching out. If you're sort of at a plateau and stuck, a mentor today isn't a teacher. That's how we used to think of a mentor. A mentor today is someone who can come by your side when they need them and open up a new door. That's it. Create a new opportunity, make a new connection that just gives you that little extra energy to get to the next level. Then the final step is to manage this momentum in a way where you keep the wheel turning. You don't panic when things go wrong. You put in the work on the things you need to do to help grow and make it go in the right direction. And certainly Tim did that very well. 
He wrote a couple more books. He turned this four-hour work week into sort of a franchise. He created the, I think it was called the four-hour chef and the four-hour body about working out. And so he just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger as he got more famous. People would buy then at that point, almost anything he would write. And then he started the podcast and monetizing in even more ways. He's done very well as a venture capitalist. And he's one of the highest paid speakers in the world. And then it, it just sounded like the more that it grew, the more opportunities came about, yeah. the more uh, mentor opportunities came about for him, like the more connections he could make to learn from other people. And then right. to take that information and then share that back with his audience. And it just kind of seemed to keep growing and growing based off of that. Right. And if we go back to the original idea of the Matthew effect, which right. was later, later sort of termed, you know, cumulative advantage. If you have this initial advantage and you play your cards right, you can build this unstoppable momentum. That's exactly what Tim Ferriss did. And I think ultimate success is different for everyone. One of the sort of reveals in the book is why I don't have the success that Tim Ferriss had is because I made some decisions to step back in certain ways when he was stepping forward in certain ways, because that was what success meant to me. It's a book, I think, for everybody. I think people can find ideas and inspirations in there at almost every sort of career level. I think so. Yeah. Going back to that question of, well, what does success mean in your life mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean, you know, what success is with somebody else. It's you defining what success means for you and then following that path. We talk about the sonic boom. Once you're trying to grow your awareness, that sonic boom of, you know, having people talk about you, how can you get that? How can you get more people to talk about you? And how can you get more of that social proof? One of the things I talk about in this book and really all of my books that I think is important is that there really isn't any overnight success. You and I, before we were recording, we're talking about a band that we both love, the, the Black Keys. Right. Yeah. I mentioned them in the book where I talked to the drummer of the Black Keys when they were just almost on the cusp of superstardom and they were really gathering a lot of momentum and doing well. And I said, what was the key moment? What was the pivot point where things really broke open and, and things started zooming upwards? And he said, there wasn't one. We just keep working. We just keep doing better week by week, month by month. We want every record to do a little bit better. We want every concert tour to do a little bit better and you just keep building over time. Now, that's a really important concept because all this stuff fits together. You mentioned a minute ago that as you persist and as you build and build and build, you can reach out to bigger mentors. You can ask for help for more important people because maybe they've heard of you. Maybe you have a mutual connection or something like that. It's the same with the sonic boom you're going to be able to create more awareness and more noise the longer you persist at this and the more that you're known. So there's this connection between the personal brand, which I wrote about in my book, Known. Right. And this, this book in some ways is like Known Part Two because Known talks about here is the pattern everyone follows to build their personal brand on the web, no exceptions. This book basically says, okay, you're doing a good job. You want to go to the next level. Here's how you create momentum to keep on going. And it applies to all business. Don't get me wrong. But there is definitely a connection between being known and your ability to create bigger and bigger sonic booms. When I was starting out, nobody heard of me. Nobody heard of me. Nobody was reading my blog. I would be lucky, Matt, if I could create a sonic whisper. <laughs> but look, you know, I've been blogging for 13 or 14 years now. I've had a podcast for nine years. I've written nine books. I've spoken at conferences all around the world. And 
as my reputation has grown, my ability to ask for help promoting things also grows and that grows the momentum. And I think one of the things too that helps out with that is being able to help others along the way and finding those people that may need your knowledge, your ideas, your strengths. They may be further ahead than you. They may be more successful than you, but there may be one little piece. There may be one strength or idea that you have that can help them. And then if you help them, it's kind of a uh, reciprocal effect. You know, I had an experience today where somebody who I didn't know read one of my blog posts and wrote me a long email and said, you know, you really got me thinking about this. And I thought about this and I thought about this. And I wondered if, Mark, if you ever thought about this. And he put so much thought into that, that he sort of came out of nowhere and began this discussion with me. And I'll never forget the person because he really... He really put a lot into this and was trying to connect with me in a very meaningful and deep way. I think that's a way that you can be remembered. There was a time I remember there was a a woman who um, I think I had shoulder surgery or something. And she made me a box of cookies. Oh, wow. It just made an impression on me that someone paid attention to me. And thought enough of me to say, look, he's probably in a lot of pain. He's going through physical therapy. I'm going to make him these cookies. And I ended up hiring her as my art director. So that's how the world works. And I also want to emphasize that it's not doing things like that. It's not just about gain. It's also about giving. Right, right. And at the end of the book, I talk about how we can use this power of momentum to help others and change other people's lives. Because we know from the research, without question, momentum begins with some spark, with some little push, some little advantage. Maybe you can connect someone to a person who can help them, an opportunity, an idea, advice, encouragement. There was this really touching moment a few weeks ago I was on a a clubhouse show. I guess you call them shows or I don't know. What what do you call a podcast event? Yeah, event. Yeah, clubhouse event. Clubhouse event. So I was on the stage, quote unquote, (laughs) and then people can raise their hand, quote unquote, and get on the stage. So this guy gets, you know, raises his hand. He says, Mark, I just wanted to tell you that you were a guest lecturer at my university And you stayed after class and answered all my questions. And you looked at me after patiently answering all those questions and said, you are going to go so far. I can tell by your questions, you are going to be a great marketer. He said, I had already dropped out of school once. I was now an older college student. I was about to drop out again but you said something to me that no one had ever said to me before. You encouraged me, you saw my potential and I completed my degree and now I work in marketing. I have a great job and I'm supporting my family. And it was because of that moment. Wow. So so that's all it took was to look him in the eye and give him encouragement, right? That's a spark. That's a spark that can create momentum that can change the world. That's why, I mean, I never say no to those opportunities for me to create sparks for young people, struggling people in some way. Last week, I went to, it's a special school for children who are in families who are in crisis. So they don't have anywhere else to live. Right. It's basically a a ranch. So, you know, I taught a creative writing class to three kids three teens who had come from these troubled families. And the teacher said, wow, why do you do this? And I said, I will never say no, because maybe there's something I'll say that will spin their lives in a different direction. And you could tell as they wanted to be writers and they met someone who's actually written books. And you know what, Matt, their eyes were like wide as saucers. And I know I had an impact on them. So we can all, we all have that ability to send the elevator back down and lift someone else up 
who needs some help at this time? It's seeing those opportunities. Of course, there's going to be those opportunities and those doors that we need to decide, you know, are the opportunities for success for us moving forward in our momentum, but then also being able to pay attention to and recognize those doors, those opportunities to really help somebody else. Right. And provide them that momentum because it's not just the legacy that we get to leave as individuals, like cumulative advantage being your legacy, it's helping Mm -hmm. others to be able to create momentum so that they can leave a legacy too. Right. And, and, and that's really the answer, right? If you look around the world and you see all the problems and you look at the economic disparity and you look at the hunger and the suffering, there's nothing we can really do. There's nothing we can really do to solve these huge cosmically complex problems. But here's what we can do. We can do one good thing. We can do one helpful thing. You know, as my friend told me in the story at the, at the very end of the book, she said, it, it might seem like this overwhelming ocean of problems, but even the ocean isn't complete without a raindrop. You can just be the raindrop that gets something started. And you may not even know, like that guy that came up to me in the clubhouse thing. I didn't know I had that impact on him till yeah. it's probably been six or seven years later. Yeah. So just send the elevator back down and create sparks for other people. And that's how you can really change the world. Well, and then this just hit me. And I think this is a good way to kind of circle back around, close everything out. It kind of turns that Matthew effect on its head in a sense, you know, for, because Matthew 25, 29 says for everyone who has will more be given and he will have abundance. So I take that to say, if you have those opportunities and those doors to help other people, to provide those sparks for more people, then you'll start to recognize more and more opportunities to create more sparks for more people. That's right. And that's when you get down to it, that's really the true biblical meaning of what that was supposed to be about in the first place. Yeah. (laughs) Is that the more that you're filled with a Christian spirit, the richer you will be. And if you're not filled with that spirit, you're going to be always trying to look for something and fill a hole. And so, you know, for me, it's just like, I have you know, abundance of something, even if it's not money, I have an abundance of experience. I have a a abundance of stories. I have abundance of ability to teach people how to write and how to speak and how to create content on social media. And I can share that generously. And I know I'm having an impact on the world because people are, are, are telling me that, uh, every week people tell you, and then you can see it and you can hear it others. You know, you can hear people talking about the lessons about the seam, you know, hear people talking more and more about momentum like this. So that's always cool to see. I was interviewed by Jeff Bullis, a friend of mine down in Sydney, Australia, and he read the book and he did a podcast interview with me. And he said, Mark, I just want to tell you what a sneaky fellow you are. (laughs) You wrote a very good business book but you're also teaching us how to be better human beings. And I think that's a good way to sum up cumulative advantage. That's it. That's it right there. Well, Mark, if you were to create a soundtrack or if you had even just a desert island song yeah. for, for cumulative advantage, what would you choose? Well, and I have to tell your audience that initially deferred this question because I just don't like thinking that hard. <laughs> but Matt's been kind enough to get me off the hook and say, okay, well, what would be one song? Yeah. You know, and one of my favorite artists is Bruce Springsteen. And one oh, of my favorite, me too. one of my favorite songs from my childhood was Born to Run. Yeah. And when you think about what momentum is about, that seam, it's about running through that seam as far and as fast as you can. And it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or how much money you have. You can create momentum. You were born to run, find that seam, run through it, and create momentum for yourself and your business. Use your strengths, use what you've got, and run right through it. I love that. Love Bruce. 
All right, Mark, this has been a really great conversation. I absolutely appreciate this. I've learned a lot from you, but where can people go to learn more? Matt, first, I'd like to thank you for being such a great host and being so well prepared. It means a lot to me that you had the care to read the book and ask such thoughtful questions. And it's no wonder that your podcast is doing so well. Well, my pleasure. Yeah, just great job. You can find me at businessesgrow.com. I've got a blog. I give away my best ideas. I've got a podcast. Haven't missed an episode in nine years. You can find my books. You can find my social media connections. I follow everybody back on LinkedIn. And uh, that's a businesses grow. There you go. Excellent. Well, Mark, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Matt. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Mark Schaefer. So go ahead and check out his book, Cumulative Advantage. It's going to help you learn how to develop, build, and manage unstoppable momentum and succeed against all those odds stacked against you. And if you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It's going to make it a lot simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one, which is a super special episode, and I'm so excited to be able to share it, but I can't share anything about it just yet. Just know that I get to talk about some new studies and new information being released about my all-time favorite subject. So go ahead and subscribe. You'll automatically get that episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Simple Brand Podcast. Want to make your listening experience simple and automatically receive each new episode? Visit our website, simplebrandpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. If you're finding value from the Simple Brand Podcast, leave us a rating or review. That helps us get the show to the ears of the people who need it most. Be sure to catch Matt right here next week. Same Matt time, same Matt channel. Until then, keep it simple.